So I'm going to talk about uh, active optimization and in embedded learning systems. And um, uh, as you just heard, uh, I've uh, recently uh, moved over to Uber at the Advanced Technology uh, Center. And so what I'm going to do first is just talk to you about a particular uh, embedded learning system that I've become newly interested in. Uh, and then we'll go, on to, uh, we'll go on to active optimization after that. Um, and so here we go. What I'm going to do is start with a, uh, a brief history of some of the vehicle autonomy at CMU. Um, and so it goes back quite a ways. Uh, in fact, even before this, but this is a reasonable place to start. So this is the NavLab project back from the 80s. Uh, and so this is a giant van. And there's a reason it's a giant van. Is it has to be that big to hold all the computing it needs to actually do anything. Um, and of course, this is also an interesting time in robotics. This is a time when um, you always keep the camera running just in case something good happens. And so that was the, that was the state at this point. And so that project uh, progressed quite a bit, uh, uh, not necessarily culminating, but uh, hitting a big milestone with the no hands across America. Um, this vehicle dro drove from Pittsburgh to LA over 98% autonomously. Uh, it drove 70 miles at one stretch without, uh, without any interventions from the, from the driver. Um, it's hard to believe that was over 20 years ago already. Um, you can see that this vehicle is pretty simple. It's just image-based steering. And it kind of, from an AI perspective, it's pretty stupid. It doesn't know anything. It's just pointed at a lane, and it knows how to stay in the center of it and has no idea what's going on around it. Um, the other thing that's fun about this is it uses what was then called a multi-layer perceptron. So it, it was actually going during the previous incarnation of deep learning. It's kind of interesting that it's gone two full cycles already since uh, self-driving cars started. Uh, of course, following that, uh, at CMU, uh, we went on to do other things. So this is Crusher. This is an off-road system. So there's some nice additions here. This one knows where it is now. It has GPS. It also knows where it's going. It's got a waypoint to get to. Uh, it's added some LIDAR to it. Um, it senses objects, so it can try to get around things. Uh, but of course, it doesn't have any sort of map, uh, and it doesn't have any concept of an object being something that might move and you might have some complex interaction with. Uh, still, it was able to do quite impressive performance. Uh, then in 2007, another big milestone was, was hit in self-driving vehicles, right? This was, the, this was the DARPA Urban Challenge. So there was a mock city set up. Uh, lots of teams put their vehicles out there to do fully autonomous driving in an urban environment. And there were a couple of big uh, advances, advances here as well. So these vehicles now have good maps. They have full 3D maps of what's around them so that they have a, a good understanding of where they are and what they expect to see when they're out there. They also have the ability to reason about the other objects out there. So they're thinking about what those objects are. Are they static? Are they moving? If they are moving, where are they likely to go? Uh, they're doing all of this. Uh, of course, one great thing that happened is CMU wins. Um, that's always good. Um, but perhaps the milestone here was really this was when Google looked at what the CMU team did and really what all the other teams that did well in this competition did. And they said, you know, this, uh, there's something here. We're, we're going to get serious about this. And that's, that's where the Google, Google Car project got going. Of course, CMU also went on uh, to see the commercial possibilities here. So they started looking at uh, things like construction and farming and how those sorts of vehicles could be automated. In this case, the, go the, the goal is not really to get the driver out of there so that you can spare the driver's time and attention. It's really just safety and efficiency. Um, when you're in a small pickup truck and you drive over something you shouldn't, you know, maybe you pop the tire on your truck and you have to replace it. When you're in this thing and you drive over something you shouldn't, it was probably that pickup truck. And so it's, it's a lot more expensive to make mistakes on this system. So scrolling ahead, uh, Uber also saw the potential here. And last year in January, it opened the Advanced Technology Center uh, in Pittsburgh to look at vehicle mapping, safety, and autonomy. Uh, and so many of the faces you see on the slide there are actually people that were involved with some of those early pro earlier projects that I showed you. <clears throat> and so this, for those of you who ever, haven't already seen this on the web, this is uh, 
This is Uber's self-driving car. You can see the cameras on the top, the LiDAR. Of course, it has radar, it has IMUs, uh, all the other sensors that you put on self-driving cars. Um, and so this is the thing that we would like to do impressive things with. And so here, let me just put up an example of what we would like to do here. And I say like to do. <laughs> this car is not driving itself. This is just a person driving around. But it gives me, gives me, it's actually terrifying for such an ordinary video, something that three years ago I would have probably fallen asleep in front of. I now find it terrifying. You can see there's all kinds of chaos, cars, pedestrians, bikes. There's all these markings on the road. Some of them matter, some of them don't matter. There are signs all over the place. Some of those matter, some of those don't matter. All kinds of other objects going on around there. There, a trolley car goes by. You don't even have those in most places. There are various kinds of signs that are obscured by things. It's just absolutely terrifying. And so when you look at this kind of system, you realize the, the sort of the magnitude of the challenge that's ahead here. And of course, Uber's not the only one doing this, right? Lots of companies, lots and lots, way more than the number of pictures on this slide are working in this area. And so what that means is we have a need and an opportunity to change what goes into a car. So if you think about it, now there's going to be a lot more data, bandwidth at lower latencies, more computing power. Also, there will be less price sensitivity and really changing product specs. We'll get back to this mode where it's safety and efficiency that people care about when they think about self-driving cars. And maybe branding and style has to take a little bit of a back seat until those first things are done right. What does that mean? Because the system's so complex, active learning and optimization in these systems, it's going to be a necessity. It's going to be on board. It's going to be off board. It's going to be never ending. Uh, this is the only way to get a complex system like this working. And so that's the uh, embedded learning system that, that I would like to talk about here. And now, uh, so I'll switch gears. Now let's talk about active optimization. Uh, for those of you that are Bayesian optimization fans, my, my apologies for making the name active optimization. I do it only because I think it's a little more accurate. Lots of people take Bayesian approaches to this, but you, you don't need to. You, you, you can do other things as well. So I think active optimization is a, is a good title. Uh, so what's the problem? Um, the problem is we have some black box function, like this one here, and it's very expensive to evaluate. Uh, you can't get gradients from it usually, and yet you want to find the optimum of this function with a pretty small number of experiments. So, okay, that's simple enough. Why, why, why is that something anyone cares about? Well, actually, people have cared about this for a long time under many names, right? Statisticians would call this design of experiments going back a, lo a long ways. Uh, I already mentioned Bayesian optimization. And of course, this is very connected to banded algorithms as well. All these things are quite simple, quite, quite similar, sorry. So what might you want to do here? Well, the classical example, a lot of machine learning people here is tune the hyperparameters of your supervised learning algorithms. Uh, people who do deep learning know that it takes a long time to train those algorithms, so just finding out what the hyperparameters could, should be is quite a challenge. But many other things have the same challenge. Any physical system that you want to optimize, it's very expensive to run those experiments. Uh, and in fact, there are many systems that require expensive simulations, and you want to do optimization through the simulations, and you have the exact same problem. It's just too much computation. You can't do that many parameters, so you have to be smart about how you, uh, how you choose the parameters. Okay. Uh, just a little comment on the different varieties here, although I'm then going to immediately gloss over those. The, the, there, there are different scenarios here, right? Some of these have uh, cumulative measures of performance. These would be things like online advertising and hedge funds and clinical trials where, where it's really the cumulative performance of the algorithm while it's searching that matters. Others are pure optimization or search problems. It only matters the best thing you found along the way or how many of things above some threshold you found along the way. So there's many variants of this. The algorithms are actually quite connected to each other, and so I'm just going to gloss over those distinctions uh, from this point forward. So what's the strategy here? What is the active optimization framework we use? Well, the idea is very simple. Because experiments are so hard to run for this function, Every time we do run an experiment, we're going to collect that data point and use function approximation 
to try to learn a surrogate function so we can ask queries to the surrogate function. We often do that with the Gaussian process. Um, and I'm not going to go through everything on this slide, but the main thing about the Gaussian process, of course, is that it gives you nonlinear function approximation and it gives you posterior distributions on it. So you get nice confidence intervals. You know how well you're modeling the function uh, at any given time and place. And that's part of how you, how you decide um, what experiments to run. Okay, so what's our framework? We're gonna do this modeling based on the experiments we have so far. We'll have some distributions over what that function might be given the data we've collected so far. And we're gonna create some sort of acquisition function. What that is, is something we derive from the model we just fit, and then we can optimize the acquisition function to decide what experiment we want to run next. Okay, and so what are typical acquisition functions? Well, the classical one everybody uh, has, has, has heard of is the upper confidence bound algorithm. You just look at the upper confidence bound of your function uh, uncertainty there, and you pick the place where that's the highest. And that has a very intuitive uh, uh, meaning to it because some place that's high there is some place where we think it's going to perform well and also we have some uncertainty about how it's going to perform so we'll learn something from it. There are many varieties of the acquisition function uh, that have the same uh, intuitive effect on them. Expected improvement, Thompson sampling, uh, and even the, uh, the uh, banded allocation indices have that same flavor to them. Okay, so how does it work? What we do is we uh, fit the function, get the acquisition function, we maximize the acquisition function, and then that's where we run the experiment. And we run that experiment, update the fitted function, and do it again. So how does this look? Okay, so this black is our unknown function, and the gray is our current uncertainty about that function. And so we go ahead and construct the acquisition function. It's all the same, so we take a point in the middle. We run that experiment, we get this update, uh, to the upper confidence bound there. We look at that acquisition function. We again pick the maximum. We run that experiment. Update again, another experiment, pick the maximum, and so on. And so as you repeat all of this, you see that by the end, the right thing has happened in some sense. It's, it's searched that function, but it's also allocated a good chunk of its experiments near the peaks of that function so that it's really trying to find the uh, the best parts of it. Okay, so uh, great. Let's try and optimize a real system here. Um, and so the one I'm going to start with is this robot snake. Uh, so this thing has 16 degrees of freedom, and because it's all nonlinear with, uh, with friction and the dynamics and kinematics of it, it's hard to actually make this thing locomote. And so we would like to use Bayesian optimization uh, as, a, as a means of training this thing how to, how to uh, move around. And so what we do is we parameterize the controller. And so here's an example. Here's a hand-tuned controller. OK, that's fine. It's sidewinding, just like a snake. That's pretty cool. Um, how about if we wanted it to go faster? OK, so we apply active optimization. And after only 40 trials, uh, it's figured out how to make a much more exaggerated movement so that it can, uh, so that it can locomote. Here's another one. We'd like to climb up this ramp. Uh, and this is a very short video because that right there, that's what the whole video looks like. It can try all day and it's not getting up that ramp. <laughs> and so, but we went ahead and we run the, uh, the active optimization algorithm on it. And what happens is it's pretty cool. It discovered that if every so often it would twist itself vertical and back again, it could actually climb the ramp uh, without falling back on itself. Uh, and so it's pretty cool that it was able to discover that with only 40 experiments in this system. Uh, one more, okay, so those were based on just running sine waves through the joints and, and just tuning the parameters of the sine waves. Uh, but in real applications, and real in this case means this snake is for disaster recovery. When there's an earthquake, it's meant to crawl through the rubble and look for survivors. And what it often has to do in this scenario is it has to climb over obstacles. And that's a much more challenging thing to do because it's sort of a choreographed motion that gets, that gets you over an obstacle. And so we needed a starting point here to run Bayesian optimization on that. And so what we did is uh, we set something up at the museum in Chicago. And so it's a, it's a game for, for the kids. It's, um, 
it's, there's two snakes there. One has got an obstacle it's supposed to climb over, and the other one is the master. So when you move the joint on one, the other one copies it. And the kids should, tr should try to move it in a way uh, that will get the other snake over the obstacle. So everybody's heard of crowdsourcing. We called this one kid sourcing. And it was, very it was very successful because even though it was hard, only about 10% of the kids could ever get it over there. We took the trajectories for how the kids got it over there uh, and then did a dimensionality reduction to get basis functions that would be the bases uh, for our search in the active optimization problem. And so I'll just show you what, uh, what happened there. Let's see how this is going to go. So this is our snake. We gave it a little higher obstacle. Uh, this is our snake uh, trying to figure out how to get over this obstacle and actually not getting far at this point. We decided that uh, this was too hard to do straight away, so what we would do is we would uh, make the task easier to something we knew it could get over directly. This is the one that, that they were doing in the museum. And then we can put the difficulty of the task as a parameter in the Gaussian process that's being modeled. So it can sort of learn slowly and you, you bring the task up as you go. Um, and so what I want to do here, let's see if I can. Hmm. OK, I was going to try to skip you ahead to the end, but uh, it looks like it's not going to skip that fast. But, so let me tell you what happens along the way. It's pretty cool. Um, when it starts, and in fact, the way the kids did it in the museum, it just sort of flips over, the, over the, um, the obstacle there. It's not that hard to do if you just sort of get the sequence of motions right. Along the way, it has to learn to do a, a, basically a Fosbury flop. It learns that it has, to, it has to curl over backwards, and that's the only way it can get over the high obstacles. So again, it's pretty cool that it was able to figure this out uh, on its own just by being very efficient in the ways that it was searching the space. And so here's, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop it after this. It actually does, uh, it does one more higher than this one, but you get the idea just from, just from watching how it gets over this one. So it's pretty cool it's, uh, it's able to go that, uh, do that well at it. Um, OK, so uh, that's great. Life is good. We, uh, we have an active, active optimization algorithm. Uh, it can optimize real systems. Uh, it can generate cool videos. Everybody likes things that generate cool videos. Um, how about we're all done with this? Well, uh, it turns out that if you look at this optimization problem, the number of samples you need to optimize, uh, uh, um, optimize one of these systems, of course, it's exponential in the dimensionality of the system. No surprise, really. But uh, this is actually theoretically uh, demonstrated. And so what does that mean? It means you can really only use this if your dimensionality is sort of six-ish or below, something like that. Um, and of course, even with the snake, the snake's got way more degrees of freedom than that. The whole reason we had to do kid sourcing is because we couldn't optimize the whole trajectory of that snake. Uh, it would be hundreds of dimensions to write out that whole trajectory. Um, and so really, we have two problems here. One is the statistical problem that to optimize a high dimensional system, you need a lot of samples. And by nature, this is a problem where samples are expensive. You're just not going to get a lot of samples. The other one is a computational issue. There's that little detail I washed over before which said optimize the acquisition function to choose your experiment. We think of that as kind of a throwaway because it's so much faster to do that than it is to run the expensive experiment. But that also scales exponentially in the dimension. So as the dimension goes up, you can't even choose your experiment, much less run enough of them to get the optimum out of the system. So clearly something's got to give here. And so, Turns out, yes, uh, people are aware of this problem. Um, and so there's many uh, approaches to try to do something about it. And so one thread is the idea that, OK, the dimensionality of the space is large, but the real problem, the real thing that varies is some smaller dimensional set under it. Maybe it's only a subset of the variables. Maybe it's only some subspace that you can identify. Um, and so. If you can do that, you can try to identify the subspace first with not too many experiments, and then run the system on the lower dimensional space. Or even in some scenarios, if you just take a random projection of the space, it's good enough. You'll find the optimum anyway, because the optimum itself lives on such a high dimensional subspace inside of there. 
So that's pretty cool because you can really do things in high dimensions. Of course, the downside is, what if your problem doesn't have that property? What if it's not actually an easy problem hiding in a high dimensional space? What if it's actually a high dimensional problem? Um, and so one of the things that people have done is try to, try to replace the GP with a deep network. Uh, that's known to well, do well with high dimensional problems. The challenge there is that the confidence intervals really matter. You ha they have to be right or you'll pick stupid experiments. And it's hard to do a good job of that uh, with a lot of deep network uh, approaches. And so, okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna do something in between. We're gonna propose the use of an additive model for the function that you have there. So in this example, uh, there are, it's a 10 dimensional function, but what we're gonna say is that what it really is is the sum of three three dimensional functions. And so in this case, that, that function at the end uh, is the sum, one function is of the green boxes, one, three, and nine, plus a function of two, four, and eight, plus a function of five, six, and 10, and seven is actually uh, uh, ignored here. And so what that means is we'll have a bunch of small dimensional functions rather than one large one to, to work with there. And maybe that's a model that will allow more complexity in the function, but we can still do Bayesian optimization on it. And so. Don't look at all that math. Nobody wants to look at that now. All of that says, uh, all of that's there just to say the GP still works. You can just observe the final result of the, of the whole overall function, and you can do the inference to understand what each of the component functions are. All of that is still fine. Okay, so how does that look? Um, Here's an example. Here's a two-dimensional function that's composed, uh, decomposed as two one-dimensional functions. And so you can see on the, on the bottom and on the side, you have the one-dimensional function, and then you add them together, and you get that contour plot in the middle. And you can imagine you've done those experiments that are marked there with an X. Okay? Just like before, because you can, you can use the GP on this, uh, you, go, you get your confidence intervals on each of those component functions. You can look at each of them by, the, by itself. And the really good thing about that is, it turns out you can, do the, um, you can do the acquisition function optimization that way. So the way you pick an experiment in that 2D space is you find the optimum of your ac acquisition function on the function on the bottom and the, and the maximum of the one on the side and you just compose them back together and that's the experiment you run. Um, so that's pretty cool, pretty simple. And uh, it turns out that if you do this, suddenly you've got um, a situation where you can ma maximize the acquisition function in something exponential in small d. Small d is the size of the component uh, of the component functions, not the overall functions. And so, what does that mean? So, if you look at a classical uh, GPUCB, uh, it's exponential in the in the large dimensionality. If you run UCB on the additive function, now the number of samples you need is only exponential in small d. Uh, and if you use uh, the, the additive GP UCB, then you can also maximize the acquisition function in a, uh, in a small d amount of time. Okay, great. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm getting a little bit short of time, so what I'm gonna do is just skip ahead to a couple of examples of this uh, because there's one, thing, one other thing I wanna tell you about before we, uh, before we leave here. So we tested this on some, some synthetic functions. Uh, we tested this on some real functions. Um, here's, for example, a Viola Jones face detection. It's got 22 parameters in it. So normally you would never optimize a 22 dimensional space, um, but it turns out if you use this algorithm, you can do much, much better uh, than if you tried to just optimize that whole space directly, even if there's not an underlying additive uh, model for that function. That underlying function really isn't additive. It turns out uh, it, works, it works much better anyway. Um, okay. Where does that bring us? Okay, dimensionality's down, but there's a couple of other issues. One is how to choose this decomposition. Uh, which, uh, which variables should go to which component and how many of them are there. Turns out that's not that hard. You can do it randomly or you can sample from the posterior distribution of what you believe them to be. And that actually turns out pretty well. 
doing it random, randomly sounds, <laughs> sounds kind of ridiculous, but it actually works. Sometimes you get a decomposition wrong and you essentially get a, a uniform at random experiment. Sometimes you get it right and you pick a good experiment and it, it actually trades off quite nicely. Um, there are some improvements you can make to create, uh, 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 to get away from the axis aligned ones so that you can do independent uh, subspaces uh, that are rotated. But the thing I really want to talk to you about is multi-fidelity optimization. Um, and so, sorry, I'm just going to skip over the, the other, other two pieces there. So often what happens is you have, <laughs> often what happens is uh, you have a function you'd like to optimize that's expensive, but there are cheap alternatives. If you're training that deep network, you can always just use a really small training set to start with and see how the training goes for that. If you're running a simulation, many of them have a discretization parameter, and you can just run a coarse simulation and get a good idea uh, before you even start whether certain parameters are going to work or not. And so the question we want, we want to address then is can we update our active optimization algorithm to choose those fidelity levels for you? Um, and so here's the model we set up with. Here we're back to looking at a bandit style problem. And what happens is each, each arm actually has two values. The blue value, which is what its, what its response is for the low fidelity uh, uh, measure, and the green is what its response is for the high fidelity measure, and we make an, uh, an assumption that there's some bound on the difference between these. And so what we do is propose an algorithm, uh, and let me, this will be faster if I just talk you through it than if you look at those equations. So what the algorithm does is just like UCB, it goes to each fidelity level and computes a confidence bound for that arm, and then since those are both confidence bounds, it can take the smaller of those to be the the one it's going to use for that arm. And then you run UCB to pick which arm you're going to run. And, and now, OK, now you have an arm. Now you have to decide which fidelity to run it at. And there's some different heuristics you can use there about which fidelity is going to give you the most information toward the, uh, toward the, uh, the system you're trying to optimize there. Um, and so that's, that's the algorithm. It's very simple. Um, in fact, there's theoretical results on this, and um, I'm not going to give you these other than to, other than to explain the idea uh, to you. What it turns out is you can take the classical results for uh, banded algorithms that you would normally say for a whole problem, and you can compute, you can come up with analogous results that say you can optimize this in time that's related to the number of arms that, that cannot be distinguished at any of the lower fidelity levels. So there's some smaller amount of the space that you have to do at the highest fidelity level. Uh, and your optimization problem only scales with respect to that, not all the other stuff. And so if you're really curious about that, there will be uh, papers in NIPS that describe the, the, the actual theory behind that. <clears throat> OK. Uh, what does this do on real problems? So. Uh, Here's a, um, here's a uh, science problem here that has exactly that simulation uh, problem that I told you about. You can run coarse or fine grid simulations faster or slower. And so here's one where we try to identify some cosmological parameters. Um, and so what we find is that that blue curve at the top is what you get from this multi-fidelity algorithm. So it, uh, it greatly outperforms the other ones in terms, and now this, the measure at the bottom is not a number of experiments, it's actual CPU time to maximize this system. So uh, it's pretty cool that you can get such a huge uh, improvement in performance of that. Um, we did a bunch of other things. We uh, did a Viola Jones face detection version of this, same thing. You can run cheap evaluations on a small training set, uh, and the real ones are on the large one. Big improvement for that. Uh, there's other function approximation examples. Let me skip those. I want to make sure that I get back to the problem I started with, uh, which is we're trying to make um, make these self-driving cars. And so we have our own active optimization software at ATC. And so uh, the, the block diagram there, basically what it says is just that we have the active optimization algorithm there. It farms out its experiments to a, to a cluster to run them. And so it's running lots of experiments in parallel here. And it's using the selection algorithms that I described here in the talk. And so that's what we're running now. And let me, I'll skip over our synthetic experiments, and I'll just show you one example of something that we're, 
So one of many things you need to do uh, when you're driving, I mentioned at the beginning, you got to find the pedestrians out there because uh, it's kind of bad if you uh, don't notice them. Um, and uh, so it turns out uh, this is a well-studied problem, right? We're going to use supervised learning here for this problem. Uh, but it's hard to get good performance out of, out of the systems here. This is comparing two alternatives. Um, and our problem here is, is really a model compression problem. So what we did is looked at using uh, boosted decision trees for this. Uh, we have six parameters we want to tune there. And we're really, we have a multi-objective, um, uh, a two-part objective function. One is we want the, the accuracy of the classifier to be good. The other is we want the model to be simple in the sense that it has to execute quickly online on the vehicle. And so after doing this optimization, we were able to, to reduce this significantly. Uh, and we did this in, in about, we did 280 evaluations in less than 100 hours on 200 cores uh, to get this sort of per, this performance level. And so what I'd like to do now is I'll just, uh, I'll just throw my summary slide up there. Um, I think this, these kinds of optimizations are needed for complex systems. And the issues of dimensionality and fidelity are very important for making these feasible in, in, in a reasonable amount of time. There is a ton left to do. One of the things that I, have, I haven't talked about at all is that it's nice to write down six variables and say you're going to optimize them. But anybody who does engineering knows that's not what happens. You write down six variables, you try to optimize them, and your system still isn't good enough. So one of your engineers shows up and says, hey, I've got an idea. And what that idea results in is two more variables being dropped onto the pile, right? And this repeats endlessly. And so as this is happening, you need a way to keep the knowledge you learned from the smaller parameter set and use it as your parameter set grows. I think this is really a, a big challenge uh, that's left to do here. Uh, and I think it's kind of fun. It's a little bit, it's a little bit scary that uh, um, you know, this embedded learning system sounds scary. How are we going to trust this thing? How is it going to be OK to, to deploy? I would say, in reality, it's no different than classical engineering anyway. Anyone who's worked on a large engi engineering project knows that there's always some other engineer in some other part of the system you're building that pulls the rug out from under you, and you can't figure out why. And so <laughs> this is not new. <laughs> uh, but I think the fact that we, got, we have automated algorithms for it uh, will be a big help. And of course, the last line goes without saying, Uber's hiring. Uh, we're happy to talk to you.